Okay, welcome to Chapter 34, uh, Employment, uh, Immigration, and Labor Law. Uh, of course, this is one of those chapters that in later editions of the text, there's going to be some uh, revisions to look at, and there's obviously been some political contention, uh, but we'll try to stay clear of most of that, and we'll focus on uh, what we've what we've got in the text and uh, reasonable updates as to what's been going on since the publication. So we're um, we're going to take a look at this chapter 34. Then we have 35, and we're done. So let's jump in. Um, now, traditionally, uh, if if you want to take a kind of, and I hate to use the term Marxist, but um, you know, it's the lens through which many people write and look at. Uh, labor history. Um, but if you want to take a, a, and it's also a language we use, when we use the term middle class uh, or upper class, I mean, that is, that's kind of dividing the economy in a Marxist way in it, from some perspective. I am not, let me be clear, advocating Marxism here. Uh, but I think it's, it's fair to say that, that looking through that lens, just like looking through the lens of uh, libertarianism or classical liberalism, which is another economic theory, which is somewhat um, uh, important to us. Uh, it, looking through that lens, it, it does allow you to understand certain things. If even if they don't necessarily explain it completely, they allow you to understand. So, using that and with that caveat, um, under the traditional analysis, uh, you have to understand that capital or wealth made most of these rules. So most of these rules uh, it, it coming out of the common law tended to favor the people that owned the means of production. And boy, does that sound Marxist. Um, one of these concepts is the doctrine of employment at will. Now this, this also has, to be, to be fair and critical of Marxism, this also has some positive aspects for the worker. But the employment at will essentially meant that either party could terminate the employer-employment relationship at any point. Now you could see how that could be beneficial if you are, say, moving from um, an earlier economic system like serfdom and you wanted to be able to leave your farm or not work for the Lord anymore. That's great. So if, if you looked at it in that way, that would be very positive for the employee, the serf. If you look at it in a modern perspective, if you look at the ability to simply terminate someone for any reason, for example, if they're forming a union, that's kind of bad for the, um, the worker. But balancing those two things, the employment at will doctrine essentially says that you may terminate the employment relationship at any time, basically under classic law, for any reason. Now, there are obvious uh, additional um, tort remedies and contract remedies. As I said, you might have an employment contract and you can break any contract you want, but you're going to have to pay the penalties. Then there are federal regulations and state regulations. For example, there are protection of certain classes. You couldn't terminate someone because um, you didn't like their race or you didn't like their religion. And again, we'll, we'll get in and talk about some of those. Okay, so um, as I said, contract theory is one of the ways in which we modify employment at will. And, and theoretically, North Carolina is within the umbrella of federal guidelines in employment at will state. Um, but contract law can modify that. You could have a contract that says you can't fire me till this date, or if you do fire me, this happens. Tort theory, and this can be based upon fraud, uh, sometimes promissory estoppel, can also modify employment. Then we start to get to the public policy exceptions, both federal and state. So, you know, one of the difficulties addressing this is that at certain times in American history, and continuing to today, to be fair, uh, groups were discriminated against in America. Um, groups such as women, um, uh, racial minorities, religious minorities, uh, ethnic minorities, and to prevent this, uh, limitations were put into place where um, at the weakest, you couldn't discriminate against someone. You couldn't uh, fire them simply because they were a member of this class. Um, we also put in whistleblower protections, and those would be things like if you, particularly in the public sphere, if you came forward as a public employee and said, look, the government is doing this thing that's wrong, uh, there were some protections put in, relatively weak actually, 
that you couldn't terminate this person. Now, when I say you can't terminate them, anybody can be fired. What you have to understand is much like breaking a contract, if someone is fired, and if it's found that you, you didn't have the, the right to fire them, the legal right to fire them, they can still be fired, but it's considered a wrongful discharge. And that means you violated a statute or a policy or regulation, and that means that they can seek damages. Uh, some of the first regulations, and these, these were hotly contested, were in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, a lot of these arise really, um, and the, the fight really begins right around 1900, um, but it, it begins to expand such that by the 1930s, during the Great Depression, we begin to see uh, some of these enacted into federal regulations. The first thing was uh, the federal government said, and this is primarily but not exclusively under uh, Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal policies in the 1930s, uh, they said, okay, we're going to sign a contract with companies to provide stuff to the federal government. Whether you're building an, an aircraft carrier or you're paving a highway, we're going to require you to pay prevailing wages. You can't pay a lower wage. So the federal government essentially mandated it first, not that everybody pay a minimum wage, but if you're dealing with the federal government, you pay a minimum wage. And they also mandated things like overtime, and um, gradually what happened was that the government said, well, not only if you're dealing directly with the government do you have to pay a minimum wage, but if you are engaged in interstate commerce. So if you had a company like, say, McDonald's uh, or Burger King, which obviously have stores or franchises in different states, since they were engaged in interstate commerce, and Congress has the power to regulate the trade between the states, and these, they're obviously engaging in trade between the states, um, then Congress would pass laws that said this is going to be minimum wage. Um, now, continuing through, the, the next big fight we saw, uh, and again, most of these are in the 1930s, um, we saw the Fair Labor Standards Act fight. And this was passed in 1938, and uh, I can't tell you how much opposition there was to this. Um, and, and what employers said, look, you know, we need to employ children in business. It's cheaper. We're competing against other countries that do it. You can't restrict workers. So there was a, there was a huge fight about this, particularly in the U S Senate. Uh, but gradually by 1938 laws were passed that said you couldn't employ children, those under 14, um, in, in basically any for-profit labor. Uh, now, there were a few exceptions where if you worked on the family farm, if you worked for your parents, if you did things like paper routes, some labor like that was acceptable. But basically, 14 became the hard number. Then they regulated those between the ages of 14 and 18, juveniles, teenagers, and we limited how much how many hours per week they could work, and how much hazardous work. And as I said, there was a tremendous amount of opposition to this because it was seen as an interference in the labor market. And uh, usually when I teach this, I show a picture of coal miners because it was cheaper to employ small children in coal mines because you, you didn't have to dig out as big a, a seam. Um, and you could use ponies. Uh, so you would have children and ponies going underground working for 8, 10, 12 hours, um, and they could be in their early teens. And by the 1930s, uh, thanks to the Fair Labor Standard Act and others, this was stopped uh, against a great deal of opposition. <coughs> um, now, wages and hour laws, um, <coughs> excuse me, Basically, they decided somewhat arbitrarily that it was going to be, and this is just something we're used to in American society, that if someone works over 40 hours a week, we just decided, okay, 40 is going to be our, our number, you've got to pay them a bonus for every hour they work. And the bonus that was set by the federal government, again, somewhat arbitrary number is 1.5. I mean, it could have been 1.75, could have been 1.25, could have been 2.0. You know, uh, it, it could have been 40 hours a week, or they could have said, okay, so anything over 32 hours a week. Um, 
Again, tremendous opposition to this was seen as an interference in the marketplace. It was kind of a modification of that employment at will. Uh, one of the things that was included in these wage and hour laws was exemptions. So executives, certain professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, administrators, outside salesmen were all exempted. Now, the, the minimum wage, uh, there's been a great deal of contention about it. it it's it fluctuated. I believe the, the minimum wage is a little bit higher now. But um, as, as in 2009, it went up to uh, $7.25. Uh, and, you know, there's a long history um, of minimum wage increases, decreases. Uh, it hasn't really changed um, under the Fair uh, Labor Standards Act uh, since really July of 2009. So it's been more than 10 years. Um, now, states are free to change that. Some states have a, a $15 an hour minimum wage. But it, it hasn't gone up for more than a decade, and obviously with inflation, it, it has been impacted. Um, it's a somewhat contentious argument, but again, um, minimum wage, you have to pay at least $7.25, um, although you can include certain things in the wage to reduce that, and certain groups of people, as I said, are not covered. Prisoners is another example of people that aren't covered. Um, in 2014, there were some new overtime rules that came into effect. One of the things that had happened was businesses got very good at figuring out, hmm, let's move people into slots. We'll call them, remember, if we go back to this previous slide, we'll call them an executive or an administrator, a professional or a salesman. Even if they're doing jobs that aren't like that at all, we'll call them that. So one of the things that was done was they set a minimum salary uh, before an overtime rate. So in other words, in the, in the past, um, it, as long as you, you know, earned at least, uh, was eight or $9,000, as long as you earned, say, $8,000, you weren't, and, and we classified you as administrator, you didn't get overtime. In 2014, we said, well, if you earn less than $23,000, um, then you're going to get overtime regardless of title. Also, um, we placed some overtime exceptions on, um, we had some new overtime rules for nurses and public safety officers and firefighters. Um, also, you have to remember that um, overtime is triggered by a per week, not a per day. So we do allow people to work more than eight hours in a day and they do not necessarily get paid. This is why you can have, say, people working weekend shifts of 12 or 16 hours and not getting overtime. Again, some countries do this. Some countries don't do this. Some countries have a 40-hour week. Some countries have a longer or shorter week. And some people pay, some countries pay a not time and a half, but double time anytime you go over. It, it, it just has an impact, obviously. Um, in 1988, uh, the Workers' Adjustment and Retraining Notification was uh, passed. And this is an important law because if you ever hear, oh, you know, uh, you know, pick a favorite company. Amazon is laying off 500 people. In the past, they didn't have to tell anybody they were doing that. But under the Workers Adjustment and Retraining Notification Act, anybody that employs 100 or more workers, which would be big companies like GM or um, uh, Amazon or Google, if they're going to lay off people, they have to give notices. And now some state laws may require this as well. North Carolina generally does not have it, but it, it gives us some notice of layoffs, what's going on. The Family and Medical Leave Act, now this was very contentious. Um, the Family and Medical Leave Act uh, was one of the, I guess one of the first modern modifications of um, uh, labor law acts, um, really in a, in a long time. Um, the, this was created in 1993, and, and it really requires um, that only certain firms, uh, first of all, firms with 50 or more employees, establish the right for unpaid leave, with some exemptions. Uh, now, again, this is this makes America very unique in the world. Uh, most of the rest of the industrialized world. It's not on paid leave. There's, there's 
paid leave for most of this stuff. So again, the United States is closer to that employment at will model than it is to more protections for laborers. Um, if you do not give people off up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave uh, for medical reasons, there can be damages, uh, job reinstatements, promotion, then there's court costs. And if you do it in bad faith, there's actually double damages available. Again, very contentious in 1993 when it was passed, a lot of opposition. The other big struggle um, besides wages was health and safety. Now again, uh, under something somewhat analogous to the uh, employment at will, traditionally employers, uh, if they hurt their employee, could be sued. So the employer um, would be sued by the employee under either a breach of tort theory or a contract theory. Also, theoretically, under agency theory as well. Uh, this didn't work great because, again, since employers tended to have far more assets and, and obviously control the livelihood of their workers, uh, people were hesitant to sue or didn't sue. So um, we began to see, and it didn't start in the United States, it actually started in Germany under Bismarck, believe it or not, way, way back in the 1880s. We began to see uh, federal and state regulations about a lot of health and, and worker safety. Um, in the 1970s, uh, there was a flurry of regulations related to this, and we have the creation of OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Now, that is part of a cabinet-level Department of Labor. The Department of Labor has been around since the, the 30s. But basically, OSHA, what it, what it can do is it'll set up a standard. It'll say, okay, suppose we're addressing the issue of um, do people, by repetitive motion, uh, have injuries on the job? So what, you know, an example would be carpal tunnel syndrome, people that are doing that work. So OSHA would have the power to make investigations. Okay, you know, this is... This is what's causing it. These are the issues. Then they could set up a standard. Okay, so you have to give so many breaks or do such and such to ameliorate this. And then they can actually investigate whether it's being, you know, people are being safe and they can enforce this act. So it, it set up the National Institute for Occupational uh, Safety and Health, which did the research. And then the review commission that reviews information about this. And th this is really something that is a good example of administrative law where Congress doesn't have the power to go in and look at every single uh, issue about health and safety in the workplace. Uh, so they create an agency to do that and they give that agency power to do it. Um, now, uh, OSHA is only, it doesn't cover everybody, it only covers companies with 11 or more employees. And one of the things it did is it, it protected whistleblowers. If, if you, you come in and you say, wow, you know, you're not running your factory line safe and people are being injured and they file a complaint with OSHA. You can't fire that person if you're firing because he told OSHA that you were messing up. You also have to keep records on injuries. Deaths and injuries are both have to be reported. Any fatality has to be reported to the Department of Labor. And if five or more employees are injured within a set time, you've got to make reports. Um, now, not only are there civil sanctions, but under um, some regulations and law, there's criminal sanctions if you don't do this. All right, now remember I said a lot of these rules really started with um, Bismarck back in the 1880s in Germany. Well, one of the things that they started to do was uh, workers' compensation, where they said, look, um, and it really, I believe it started with the railroads, if I'm not mistaken. They said, you know, railroads are very important. A lot of people work there, but people are getting injured. And we don't want them having to sue their employers. It's bad for their employers. It's bad for them as employees. So we want a workers' compensation law. Now, this workers' compensation law, this idea was brought to the United States, and it covers most people. Now, there's some big exemptions. First of all, it doesn't cover domestic help. Uh, it doesn't cover agricultural. You're, you're going to find that, I really think, because of the political power of the farm states in the United States, the Midwestern Plain states like, you know, Iowa and Kansas and North and South Dakota, where there's a lot, a lot of agriculture, um, they fought tooth and nail to keep workers' comp out of this, and, and, and a lot of regulation out of it. Um, agricultural workers are among the least supervised in the United States. Temps are not under this. Uh, common carriers... People who work for state and municipal government are not workers' comp. Uh, 
but basically employers join a state-sponsored insurance system. Um, and if there is an injury in the scope of employment, you fall under workers' comp. So it, it will exclude intentional injuries if you hurt yourself. Um, but the, the big impact is if you decide you're going to go to the workers' comp rule, you, you don't get to sue your employer. So the, the benefit for the employer is they get some immunity from lawsuits. The benefit for the employee is they have an alternative from lawsuits. So, um, the next thing to talk about is Social Security, um, OASDI, which is Old Age, Survival, and Disability Insurance. This is the basis for FICA, Federal Insurance Contribution Act. Everybody who earns a wage uh, for FICA um, has to pay a percentage of that um, in their, their paycheck. Now, it doesn't include all income. Um, the, the FICA tax is only on earned wages. Um, it's not on everything. Um, you, you pay 6.2% of your wages as of 2020. And then we're actually going to also, although we'll get to this, um, tack on, uh, 1.45% as your Medicaid, um, so together, your total withholding here is uh, 7.65. Now, there is a cap on this. Um, in, in other words, Congress decided that um, there's a certain amount of money that after you earn over it, we're not going to pay a tax on it. Um, now, there's... There's some contention about this. Um, it, it's actually, a, I believe, uh, it's subject to going up. I think it's going to hit, um, in 2020, the max earnings is going to be 137000 So it's, it's, gonna, it's going to up from that 113. That 113 is a bold number. But it's only on earned wages. So let's suppose I own a company and I get stock dividends. They're not taxed under FICA. Let's suppose I sell my house and I make $100,000. That's not taxed under, under FICA either. Um, what FICA taxes is only wages. So this is typically the largest single contribution most people in the United States make to the tax system. If you retire or you're disabled, you can, since it's called old age survivors and disability insurance, you will receive a payment. This is every what most people call their Social Security payment. You also have a national sponsored health insurance, and this is Medicare. So again, uh, Medicare is being funded by a 1.45% of an income. That's going to be part of that total 7.45% that everybody pays. Uh, there is no cap on that. that. That keeps going up. But again, Medicare is not deducted from capital gains or from corporate taxes, only people paying wages. Uh, now, private pension plans. Um, we do have the uh, Employee Retirement Income Security Act, or what's called URSA, which says we're not going to mandate that you have a pension. And because of that, by the way, pensions have been declining. Um, but we are going to regulate it if you have it. So you're, we're going to regulate. We're going to say you have a right uh, once after a certain point. Nobody can take your pension away at best. Um, we're also going to uh, set, you know, um, how it is invested. And, and that gets a little bit beyond the scope of what I want to talk about in this course. But basically, it doesn't allow you to go to Vegas and bet the pension fund. The unemployment compensation system, which also regulates it. Um, this is, this says, okay, if someone is unemployed, each state pretty much decides um, a maximum amount of money that you can get and decides the period. Now, North Carolina is among the, the least generous, to be honest about it, uh, unemployment compensation uh, systems. So uh, now that's not always been so. Um, 
there was a heavy revision of North Carolina unemployment law a few years back, um, and it, it really dramatically reduced um, the amount they pay um, and, and how long they pay. Um, now, North Carolina's maximum currently um, is $350. That's, that's the max. Now, uh, because of COVID, for a while, everybody was getting a $600 um, on top of that um, enhanced unemployment benefit. Also, North Carolina limits how long you can receive it. So the each state makes the decision where to put this. Now, how does it get paid for? Employers are taxed as a percentage of gross wages, and that goes into a fund to fund unemployment. Now, obviously, when things are going well, when the economy is very strong, this tends to build up an amount of money. And then when the economy goes in the toilet, that fund, the unemployment fund, should be drawn upon to pay. Um, unfortunately, given the way people work, very often um, when things go well, what they do is they cut the unemployment tax. They say, oh, well, we're not using it. Let's not collect it. The result is when the economy goes badly, it can be difficult to fund these things, and often they have to go to the federal government. Um, one of the things that did happen, and this was I believe about Ronald Reagan in the 1980s as part of a Budget Reconciliation Act, unemployment income is taxed. Traditionally, it wasn't. When you got your unemployment check, it wasn't a taxable event. Now it is. You have to pay tax on it. Okay, um, COBRA, uh, Consolidated Omnibus uh, Reconciliation Act. This uh, covers certain uh, plans. Basically, if and, and you, you have to remember, and this is another is historical accident. Um, the reason most of us get medical insurance from their employers is because of World War II. Um, believe it or not, during World War II, there was a huge labor shortage. And companies were frozen. They couldn't pay more wages to people because the government didn't want inflation getting out of control. So they said, you can't bid against each other to get employees. So companies said, well, how can we get people to come to work for us? They said, I know what we'll do. We'll offer medical insurance. And so quite rapidly, 1942, 43, 44, even a little bit earlier as, as America was gearing up for war, um, companies began offering their workers um, medical insurance, such that by the end of the war, it was just very, very common, and that kind of continued. Uh, again, most countries didn't necessarily do that. They didn't have the same path towards this. Uh, but most of us get our medical coverage from our work, from where we work, um, unless, of course, you're collecting uh, Medicare or Medicaid. So under this, workers get 60 days of continual coverage. Uh, the employer has to keep it for up to 18 months. Um, employees can be compelled to contribute for this cost. So COBRA can be pretty expensive. Uh, and there are certain limits as to when and how it applies. Employer-sponsored group health plans. Now, again, these are not mandatory per se, and this is where we start to stick our, our, our toes very delicately into the Affordable Care Act because I'm not sure that it's still going to be around even when you hear this lecture. Uh, there is obviously some debate about um, can you compel an employer to establish this? And can there be fines about this? But typically, there is no mandatory plan. Uh, now, there are, um, again, these fights about pre-existing conditions. And you know, I, I don't quite know how to help you with this because um, there are rules under HIPAA, uh, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which place limits on not covering pre-existing conditions. And currently, under the Affordable Care Act, you can't refuse to cover pre-existing conditions. Also, there is, and I don't think this will be affected by any changes at all, substantial amounts of rights of privacy to your medical records as well. But this is one of those areas that really is very contentious. So that gets us the Affordable Care Act. This covers uh, employers with 50 or more employees. You've got to offer health care. There's also 
a phase in for smaller. But basically, um, the government set it up where they gave you a tax credit for costs. So it wasn't a tax deduction. It didn't say, oh, you paid $100,000, you can deduct $100,000 from your gross income. They said, you paid $100,000 in taxes, you can take off, uh, you paid $100,000 in medical care, you can take off $3,500 straight off your taxes. Uh, there is a fine there. Um, the cost uh, of the, and it, it can have a cost, shouldn't exceed a percentage of the employee's income. Um, if the employer doesn't, or there's a problem, and the employee goes out and gets a state-sponsored exchange, uh, and that employee gets a subsidy, so in, a, in other words, if the employer is not generous and he doesn't establish a policy that's worth a damn, he actually can wind up paying money. Again, this is very contentious. This is where the real fight is. Um, can you force people under penalty to get insurance? And if they don't, can you penalize them? Uh, it's before the Supreme Court right now. I will warn my friends on the left and the right. Uh, I'll warn my friends on the left. I, I think it's in trouble. I don't think it's going to be completely struck down, but I think it's in trouble. I'll warn my friends on the right that if it does get struck down, um, the alternative is going to be socialized medicine. Because if you're saying you can't use the marketplace to create a way to fund this, but you also recognize that most people want some sort of way to get reasonable cost health insurance and the marketplace isn't providing it, it's going to be the government. Um, electronic monitoring the workplace. There is, in theory, um, some privacy rights. Um, this is called the penumbra theory, and that's the argument that if you take all the rights in the Constitution, they cast a penumbra, sometimes pre-number, but penumbra is correct, or shadow of, of privacy. Now, um, you typically do not enjoy complete First Amendment rights unless the government's your employer. Most laws favor the employer. In 1986, we, we passed the Electronic Communication Privacy Act where um, employers are allowed to intercept electronic communication with consent from employees. So basically when you get your job and you've got an email account through your employer, they're allowed to read it because when you get that account, most people are compelled to waive. Uh, lie detector tests. Uh, I've had some experience with these. Um, they are surprisingly enough banned under the Employee Polygraph Protection Act to hire people, fire people, investigate people, promote people, but, and here's the big but, um, it doesn't cover certain types of companies. The federal government can use them however they want, so can the state, local government, security companies, drug companies are free to use them. Um, there's also certain rights if an embezzlement or theft is accepted. Now I will say this, um, having dealt with lie detectors for 35 odd years, 40 odd years as a professional, they're not very accurate. They're not like on TV. Um, unless you have very controlled conditions, you, you don't get a good success rate. You have a lot of false positives, a lot of false negatives. Drug testing is primarily limited by state law. Uh, again, there are a few restrictions in North Carolina. Most of the cases really deal with the accuracy of the tests. Are you getting a false positive? Or are you getting a false negative? And that's one of the reasons why, uh, if you're dealing in business, it's always best to get multiple tests. Usually there's a cheap screening test uh, that costs a few dollars, and then most employment attorneys will recommend if you're going to have a testing system, which they're not in love with, but if you're going to have a testing system, have a tiered testing system where you have the screening test that is potential uh, drug test. Okay, this guy tested positive for uh, THC, marijuana, or alcohol. Great. Now I have a more sophisticated one uh, to make sure that it's correct. Uh, AIDS um, was a very hot issue for a while. Uh, and in 1990, we have the Americans with Disability Act, which says you can't discriminate against people with disabilities. AIDS or being HIV positive is deemed to be a disability. Um, you are supposed to make reasonable accommodations to those people suffering with disabilities under the American Disabilities Act. Um, and there are some restrictions in North Carolina. All right, let's talk about immigration. 
very contentious. Uh, we're just coming out of the election with the big fight about build that wall and all that. Um, there have been attempts throughout American history, and again, if we go back and you, and you look at regulation of immigration, there was very little regulation in the United States um, through the 1800s. And around the 1900s, you began to really see a ramping down and a restriction of immigration for different reasons. I think one of the reasons is you begin to get people coming into the country from Southern Europe. Uh, those would be Italians, Greeks, uh, Eastern Europe, you begin to see Jews and Poles come in. So long as Germans, Irish, English, Norwegians, Dutch, they were coming in, there was criticism. I mean, you can go back and see some of these very vicious racist cartoons, but not a lot. So there was restrictions put in. Um, then you have World War I. Restrictions get harsher. World War II, there's some opening of the floodgates. Then you have the booming 60s. Um, you know, different things go on at different times here. And in 1986, we have the Immigration Reform and Control Act, which sets up uh, restrictions. It requires, uh, because they really saw employment as driving this, um, to require employment verification. So uh, basically, you can't knowingly, if you're the boss, hire someone who is an illegal alien or is not in the country legally. In 1990, this was reformed a little bit more. This is the famous green card system where uh, legal resident aliens uh, were allowed to get a green card to work. And probably right now, um, the H-1B visa system, which is basically saying, we need to import this labor because we can't find this labor in the United States and we need to keep a vibrant economy. This has been used, and to be fair, abused by some companies. Um, now, traditionally, um, you had Immigration and Naturalization Service. Um, you've had some reforms. Everything is now pretty much under Homeland Security. And one of the things that has been done is to um, place more burdens on the employees to get employers to get information, but this is really weakly enforced. Uh, I've, I've got to say, just to be fair about this, um, we've tried to set caps on legal immigration, but the problem is there is a hunger for cheap labor, and particularly in agriculture. What you're going to see is um, many uh, industrial concerns um, will employ cheap farm labor because it's difficult to find Americans who work um, on a farm for low wages and it's easier to find immigrants. We have a program where you can import people paying them a prevailing wage, sometimes a minimum wage, but a prevailing wage, and it's got certain maxes you can bring in that allows you to bring in legal immigrants. Um, and typically you'll have people coming in routinely from places like Haiti and they'll come in and they'll pick certain crops or they'll just, that's what they'll do. Uh, but then you have right next to it an illegal market. It's, it's very contentious. It's very difficult to come up with a way in which you could preserve agriculture um, and at the same time control immigration. Now, recently, some states have tried to control this. Arizona tried to regulate immigration, but it largely got slapped down because it was deemed to be pretty much a federal purpose. Um, we do allow people to stop uh, and confirm identities if you have a lawful purpose, but we don't kind of allow per your papers, please. All right, let's talk a little bit about labor unions. This is a long chapter. Um, again, going back, and this is one of the reasons I talked about the, the, the bias that existed early on, um, you might say, well, labor unions are fine. If you can organize a corporation, you can organize a labor union. Well, it wasn't seen that way because, again, things tended to slant more towards capital. Uh, so labor unions were often illegal. Um, and, the, and the problem here is people wanted to organize to get some rights. They wanted to have uh, an alternative, you know, a, a, something to oppose um, the corporations and rich people. Uh, but 
the law said, well, you can't have unions, or if you have unions, you can't strike, you can't negotiate. Uh, the result of which is that that drove a lot of these unions in a more radical way. So by the 1930s, this began to change. In 1932, and again, this, this really has to do with the election of Franklin Roosevelt. Um, we have the LaGuardia Act, I think it's called the Norris LaGuardia Act, excuse me, of 1932, which uh, prior to this time, you could go into federal court, you just get an injunction saying, my workers shouldn't be allowed to strike. The courts would say, you're right. You'd almost always get these injunctions when you ask for them. Uh, or, I don't want my workers organizing, I'm going to fire them. Oh, go ahead. So, Norris LaGuardia says, workers are allowed to strike. Federal courts can't issue injunctions to stop this. Workers are allowed to organize. And again, there was huge opposition to this, but it, it got through. Uh, in 1935, we have the creation of the National, well, we have the passage of the National Labor Relations Act and the NLRB board. But this was very important because it said, if you have a union, they have a right to engage in collective bargaining. You've got to bargain with them. You may not come to agreement, but you've got to bargain with them. It banned things like companies stopping union organizations. It banned companies controlling the labor union that worked for them. It banned, well, I won't hire you if you're in a labor union, or I will fire you if you're in a labor union. It all said you can't discriminate against them if they use this act to enforce it. It also said you can't refuse to engage in collective bargaining. You have to at least talk to them. Um, it also created the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, which oversaw union elect. Now, this has become very contentious, to be honest about it. What happens is if you have a pro-labor president, he gets to appoint people to the board, and the board is more favorable to labor. If you have a pro-capital president, he tends to appoint people to the board that really allow uh, companies to discriminate. So the National Labor Relations Board, very much a political creature. It oversees union elections, it investigates unfair labor practices, and it has the power to issue cease and desist. Uh, now, labor unions were seen as too powerful by the 1940s, so we began to see a reaction against it. Uh, in 1947, we have the Right to Work Labor Management Act, which makes closed shops illegal. That's where you couldn't be hired unless you were in a union. It also made feather bedding illegal, and it made it illegal for union membership to continue in order to remain employed. Uh, in 1959, we have Labor Management Reporting Disclosure, and this was really because unions were seen as corrupt internally. So it opened up unions to direct supervision, it banned uh, hot cargo agreements, it banned secondary boycotts, and these were both tools that labor unions had used to organize. Typically, organization begins with authorization cards, uh, where you get people to agree that they want to form a union. If they can get 30 people, 30% 30 of the workers to say, we want to have an election, you're going to have an election. You then go to the National Labor Relations Board and they supervise this election. And companies are not supposed to interfere, although to be fair, they routinely do. Um, when the union is voted into existence, it is the exclusive bargaining representative of the, Europe, the workers. Um, they can set wages, benefits, working conditions. Everybody's got to negotiate in good faith. If they don't, um, they can strike. Now, strikes, uh, you have a right to strike. Anybody can strike. And workers can refuse to cross strike lines. But employers in the United States can hire substitute workers. Now, there's two types of strikes. If it's an unfair labor practice strike, and the strike ends, everybody that was on strike gets their job back. But if you've struck for money, there's almost no protections. Um, if they hire substitute workers and the strike ends, you don't get your job back. So it's important if it's an economic or a labor strike. Uh, we have lockouts, uh, which if you're trying to break the union with them, they're illegal. But they're used if the employer fears that a strike is coming and they simply break, they lock them out first. All right, uh, at that, we've got one more chapter, and we're done. Uh, see you in the next chapter.